Uh, I wanted to highlight the transition from the Vedic paradigm through Upanishadic to Sankhya. And that transition is kind of important for us because it gives us a sense or understanding what has happened uh, during this long period of time of thousands of years. Yes, As we already mentioned before that that transition took place from uh, Samhita period, which was like 2500 minimum BC to 2000 uh, or 1500 BC with um, Brahmanas. There was a big gap between the Samhita and Brahmana period. And then finally there was an attempt to capture the knowledge of the Samhitas in a new fashion already, and that was the Upanishads. And um, as Shubindu says, the Upanishads are, were more focused on building their own system than trying to explain the Samhita texts. Though they referred to Samhitas as the most important, as the supreme knowledge. So we looked through these uh, Adhibhuta, Adhidaiva, and Adhyatma. We saw this, uh, so our consciousness can be turned either without or within. Um, and we kind of highlighted what uh, the Vedantic yoga was, yoga of the Upanishadic rishis. So the connection between the inner and outer could be established through the um, faculties of consciousness or senses, indriyas, which become consciously passive, as Shubhendu says, and receive the inner light and bring the inner light to the surface. That's, I'm just kind of recapturing what we did already. Uh, on this ground, later in the mental structure of consciousness, a new vision um, or a new kind of philosophy comes into being which was already there in the Upanishads, but it was not totally formulated. And that is Sankhya. Shobindra speaks about the ancient Sankhya of Kapila uh, and um, of uh, the Gita. So there is Sankhya in the Gita, but it was a different type of Sankhya. It wasn't yet the atheistic Sankhya as we know it in the later period, traditional. So if you look at the conscious, how consciousness operates on adhyatmic level, on the adhidaivic level, and on the adhibhuta level, we already touched upon this. So the faculties in Sankhya were seen as those, uh, the indriyas, yes, which uh, were totally dependent on the mind, the sixth sense, and um, uh, and we're applying mind with information, um, supplying mind with information, Manas, uh, giving him uh, the perception of, or the material for the mind to choose on what to focus. We spoke about this, that the mind, Manas, is the capacity of consciousness to focus consciousness on any object of sense. And so this object of sense was supplied by the Indriyas, and by hearing, seeing, and so on. And so mind could select what it wants to focus on. It is by manas that the eye sees, ear hears, and so on. This is from Yajna Valkya. It is already in the Upanishads, but not yet formulated in the 25 tattvas of Sankhya. This is Sankhya. 25 tattvas, that means Purusha and Pradhana or Prakriti. There are two names for Prakriti. And uh, these two are eternal, Purusha and Prakriti, according to Sankhya. Uh, they are always there. And uh, if Purusha does not, it, yes, there is one Prakriti, one Pradhana, and many Purushas in the classical Sankhya, huh? but not in the Sankhya of the Gita. In the Sankhya of the Gita, 
there is uh, also Purusha, universal Purusha, and there are individual Purushas, and there is Purushottama. So, um, in Sankhya, there is no universal Purusha, there are only individual souls, and there is Prakriti. And these are eternal. So when Purusha attends to Pradhana, to Prakriti, she starts mixing up uh, her uh, gunas. Vladimir, you are muted. Vladimir is on the phone, I think. Oh. Are you sure? One second, sorry for this, yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys, this is the dental work, uh, uh, which is very rare that they call me back.
So, so sorry. Um, well, you know, appointments with dentists, they are so f fixed, uh, so many things. So sorry for this. Anyhow, back to, to the Sankhya. I see Jayashri joint. <laughs> Hi, Jayashri. Um, so the idea was that uh, the Purusha attends to Prakriti, yes, there are many Purushas, they attend to Prakriti, Prakriti starts mixing, mixing Rajas, Tamas and Sattva, and that mixture creates the worlds. Nothing is said how Purusha attends to Prakriti, what it really means. We do not know what it is, we imagine that it is witness, what is this witnessing? What is attending? What is looking at Prakriti? What does it really imply? But what it implies when the Purusha does it, when he extends his attention, his consciousness, and Purusha is consciousness. Yeah? Uh, later in the li classical literature, we will find that Purusha is synonymous with Atman, but they are very different in the Vedantic literature, in the Upanishads. Purusha represents consciousness, Atman represents the being. So the being and consciousness. Purusha is the Lord, Atman is the self. Self and the Lord, yes, as Shabindu says. These two um, elements of one being. There is being who is conscious. And the consciousness is Purusha, the being is the self, Atman. So when the attention of consciousness of the self, of being, attends to his own Pradhana, to this infinite Pradhana, Prakriti, she starts moving. Um, their relation are, uh, relations are more of the kind of course, Sankhya didn't want to specify that, that they are one and the same, that there is no Purusha and Prakriti as separate beings. Sankhya defines them as separate beings, yes? as if they exist infinitely in their own way, as it were. Um, eternal beings, um, irreducible. All these are irreducible elements, by the way. And, um, which are called tattvas, there are 25 tattvas, of which Purusha and Prakriti are part. Yeah? You can count them. So you have 20 here, 5, 5, 5, 5, and you have 5 here, Purusha, Pradhana, Buddha, Ankara, and Manas. 25 tattvas. So 10, 25 irreducible elements. Um, so when Purusha attends, she starts mixing her uh, three major movements of our nature. It is uh, Rajas, the energy, which takes Tamas, the inertia. And um, by mixing these two, we get something like Sattva. Or let us say Sattva is the presence, is the quality of Purusha which is kind of manifested in the Rajas and Tamas, if you will. Or let us say they are three independently existing <laughs> in Prakriti and they get mixed up. Whatever way you think will be partially right. Um, there is also, I was mentioning this before, in the occultism, in the Christian mysticism, there is also this thinking. There are three major letters of the mother in the occultism. And this is Aleph, Mam, and Shin. It is number 1, 13, and 21. Notice the numbers are very sacred numbers. Yeah? 1, 13, 21. 13 is death, 1 is 1 always, and 21 is the very powerful number, three times seven. Um, so these are the major letters of the mother. And interestingly, the uh, Shin is the fire, Rajas. Mam is the Tamas. Death is Tamas. And one Aleph, 
the first letter is sattva. So here we have this kind of uh, three letters which build up the whole system of manifestation. Very similar to what we have in Indian tradition. It actually tells us something that there was pre-Kaldean and pre-Vedic tradition which was same. Yeah? Because we find the same elements, the same way of thinking in another totally different Semitic tradition. And in later Christianity, they spoke about three major things. There's free will, it is Rajas, karma or rock, the fate is Tamas, something which has already happened, and free will, it is something which has not yet happened. And finally, on the top of this triangle, we have providence. And providence is interesting because it is something which supports either the free will or something which is already in, engraved in stone, you know, the rock, the fate, something would happen. So if providence is on the side of the rock, of the fate, then a will cannot win the case. Yeah? free will. If the providence is on the side of the free will, then we can change karma. We can change the destiny. So this fight between Rajas and Tamas is also in the uh, occultistic tradition, in the Kabbalistic tradition of the Semitic system of knowledge. Interestingly, yeah. or in a simplistic way, how they explain it, if you put water, tamas, on the fire, rajas, it will evaporate, sattva. This is the simplistic way of understanding. So sattva somehow includes both rajas and tamas. Somehow. So it can support either Rajas or Tamas, and in that sense, Rajas becomes more powerful or Tamas becomes more powerful. This division is actually also seen in Sankhya. If you go deeper into Sankhya, we will see that they split them. Tamasic become Tamatras and Mahabhutas, Tamasic formations, formations in which the consciousness will be embodied, and the uh, sattvic part will become indriyas and karmendriyas, yeah? whereas ahankara will hang as the rajas. It's all, I think, a little bit artificial and not totally, totally thought out, yeah? absolutely, but uh, as a scheme of thinking, it is good enough. So there is, uh, you know this, Sankhya, you know quite well, yes? The first result of this mixture will be buddhi, pure reason. Uh, that means the mind beyond senses. Mind which is not operating by the information of indriyas. It is conceptual mind, uh, thinking by ideas, concepts, and not by what um, it is being supplied by the indriyas. It's not the perception, it's conception rather. Mm -hmm. So whereas manas is more sense mind or mind of perception, it perceives what is there being supplied by the indriyas. Mm And in between we have Ahankara, ego sense. I, I guess Praveen will be entering with his uh, corrections on the Sankhya because he was waiting for Sankhya. Now he has the opportunity to speak on it. Yes, Praveen. Yeah, Vladimir. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, this is too old me actually, but. Uh, I was wondering on the previous points you have made because you started by making uh, the difference between Atman and consciousness, I think, which is very important. Um, and I wanted to understand that 
more. Uh, yeah, because Sanke is known to you well. Uh, usually Sanke is well known to everyone who studied Indian philosophy, yes. It's um, it's something which is inbuilt in every every system in a tantra in everywhere you know in yoga in the, so everybody is implying sankhya to be the foundation yeah. yes yes and the difference between purusha and uh, atman is actually in the upanishads and in the samhitas you will not find it in later later they are kind of mixed up. So you can have Annamaya Purusha or Annamaya Atma. Yeah? You can have both as synonyms in a way, but uh, as it is in Taittiriya, for example. But uh, still, if you look even into Taittiriya, you will find very interesting kind of definition. Let me open Taittiriya for you. This is what you want to clarify. Difference between Atman and Purusha, oh. and and also, um, I mean the scheme that you have explained here, uh, because uh, is it is it also correct to understand uh, uh, that there are different traditions, uh, which interpret Sankhya in different ways? Because I have seen also, uh, for example, Pradana could be Chitta. Also, this is one of the additional elements that I saw. For example, Kala is also included as an additional element in some of the systems. Um, and you also clarified that uh, in the later Sankhya, the universal Pusha is not there, uh, which I understand. Um, yes, it is not there. Yeah, Sankhya is a theistic system. It does not believe in God. Yes, yeah. uh, It's quite amazing. Yeah? Uh, so, <laughs> though it operates by two, uh, by two uh, eternal foundations of Purusha and Prakriti, still it is atheistic. There is uh, eternal uh, soul, but there is no God behind. Yeah? So, another question I had in my mind was, really, what is the science of the construction of an experience in Sankhya? Uh, it is it is not clear, for example, what is really the perceiver? Is it the mind? Is it the intelligence? Is it the ahanka? Or is it the atma? Or is it the consciousness? And the very construction of that experience, rather. But of course, uh, this is a big debate. In oh, it's very good, very good, very good question. Actually, I was I was hoping that we will arrive at this. That uh, I just started my kind of mm, yeah. laying out the basics because. Without them, it is very difficult to proceed if you don't understand where it is coming from. Yes. So, but it is true. This question, who is attending, why, how Purusha attends to Prakriti, what it means, actually, we do not know. Yeah. Uh, how his consciousness is. Uh, so, as a Mother and Shirobindo's mother spoke, yeah, without him, I exist not. Mother actually doesn't like in our tradition of integral yoga to make the distinction between Purusha and Prakriti. She says that Prakriti is a part of Purusha and we will see it later. It is totally true that Prakriti is not something which exists beyond the Purusha. Uh, though it is the way, it's an easier way to explain things to the mind. You know? Otherwise, the mind will be wondering how come they are one and the same and at the same time they are different. So to avoid that question, we speak about these two infinite realities. So even in her statement, without him, Purusha, I, Prakriti, exist not, and without me, he is unmanifest. Yeah. So that makes totally sense. When Prakriti falls into equilibrium without attention of Purusha, she disappears. Well, how disappears? In a way, she disappears in him. Yeah? She becomes part of his own kind of existence, as, as it were. But when he attends to her, so to say, it's another way of speaking. Um, as if she was there waiting for him to attend to herself, she starts moving and manifesting him. So this attention of his 
is uh, the sakshi. He is a sakshi of everything what is happening in Prakriti. And he is Anumanta. He gives sanctions to what is happening in Prakriti. And we already discussed a bit as providence. He gives actually a sanction either to free will, to Rajas or Tamas or, or something. And uh, something is going on there. But what is that attention? We do not know. And this attention is expressed here in Indriyas. We can see hearing, touch, sight, taste, smell. Yes, we have five Jnanendriyas who, who represent Purusha actually in Prakriti. It is Purusha's seeing. It is Purusha's hearing. It is Purusha's uh, speaking, uh, moving. It is him. That means without his attention, without his consciousness present in Prakriti, there would be no hearing, there would be no five Indriyas. And it's amazing because Indriyas is a, a word which carries that uh, origin of Indra. Indra is a divine mind. Yeah? It is him who actually manifested the Purusha in this functionality for manifestation. Purusha is the being which was created, according to the Upanishads, for the sake of functioning in manifestation. So Atman without Purusha could not function in manifestation, in time and space. It needed Purusha. Yeah? So according to Aitareya, Atman pulled out Purusha from the lower waters, heated him up, and faculties of consciousness broke forth, and they started the manifestation. So that is what we call sacrifice of Purusha. Purusha's faculties were offered to the inconscient ocean to start the manifestation, to start building the bodies. So that's how Purusha represents consciousness. In the Taitiriya they say a Purusha Vidha. Yes, it is in the form of Purusha that Atman is manifested as material, vital, mental, supramental, and transcendental Anandamaya. Atma is manifested in the form of Purusha. Now, this form of Purusha is important. Yes. So it is hearing, seeing, these are the Indriyas, here they are. They are building the body. This body of Purusha embodies the faculties of seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking, feeling, touching, moving. Yeah? It's him. It's his faculties, which, which uh, Prakriti manifests. So what he attends to her with is everything Prakriti manifests. This is an amazing thing. And mainly these Indriyas, Shnyan huh? Indriyas. Ladi hmm. I have a question. How come this Purusha was pulled out from the inconscience? Well, it's a difficult question. I have no answer to it. But intuitively, you can keep this question, and um, it is good that it is there at the back of your mind always. How come that Purusha? But you have to know the text. You have to see that Apas and Ambhas, they are higher supreme waters and lower in conscient waters, and why uh, Atman pulled it from the lower waters, heated it up, and then you will see how all his faculties broke forth, his mouth broke forth from the mouth, Agni from speech, from speech Agni. His nostrils broke forth from his nostrils, um, Prana from Prana Vayu. His eyes broke forth from eyes. He seeing from seeing, sun was born, light. His ears broke forth from ears, uh, hearing from hearing, Dishaha, the directions. His uh, Tvak broke forth, his... Um, um, uh, skin broke forth from skin, the Oshadhi Vanaspatayaha, what is that? Touch, and from touch, the, the, the greenery came into being uh, as a universal, yeah? That's all the greenery. His, um, his heart broke forth from heart, the, um, 
mind manas and from the manas chandra uh, the uh, moon was born soma and his navel broke forth from the navel apana from apana mrityu death his uh, shishna was broke broke forth shishna is procreatory organ from procreatory organ retas the seed and from retas apas lower waters now why i came up to lower waters because retas that foundation for manifestation is somewhere in the lower waters now there's something to to intuitively get um there is no way to explain it to the mind or something uh, to make it philosophical it's just um, an intuition which is true yeah? and um, it has to kind of help us uh, in understanding of the world how it is why through the seed through ratus the embodiment into the formation of the matter it takes place yeah so he has to be material yeah and not just purusha that purusha uh, the uh, universal without the body thank you thank you right and if we look here we see a similar thing we see from hearing touch sight taste smell we come down to the apas and prithivi we come to the lower procreatory excretory organs these are the lowest in our in our body in our torso we have also legs and hands and speech these are all the karmendrias which are acting upon the outer being yes? we are acting through the word we communicate through sound through expression of ourselves of our wish we express ourselves through hands touching pushing catching giving yeah? uh, these hands are very important and then we have pada which are communicating us with other world by moving us our this body everywhere yeah? and then we procreate we leave progeny interestingly and we cast out everything what we don't need in our body which we took in and whatever is not needed cast out it's also something we leave behind in the animal kingdom it is a very important thing they are always you know marking their own presence through these excretory yeah excretory uh, leftovers here and there they're pissing or something by that they recognize the territory they are marking the territory physically uh, by this uh, so this is also action upon the world and you see the karmendrias are those senses of action of this body embodied state which are acting upon the other beings and there is no other there are only five of these just think about it how brilliantly um, the sankhya captured this there is no other action upon the world from this body only these five if you want to act upon the outer world these will be the five and they are somehow matching with the indrias jnanendrias yeah? well maybe not totally directly but indirectly meaningfully they're matching there is hearing in speech yes somehow hearing is more perceptive or receptive and watch is more active proactive on the world yeah so if i want to hear the animals are always hearkening they're always listening carefully yeah? our cats are the, the smallest noise they are immediately attending touch yeah, so receptive sight receptive or perceptive taste and smell that's what we do all major indrias five indrias and they are in kind of amazingly correspond to five major elements akasha vayu agni apas and prithivi yeah it's quite clear and behind them the ratan matras those elements which build these mahabhutas 
and that is the state of the being in ethereal, aerial, fiery, liquid, and solid state. Shubindu beautifully describes the unfolding of these of these elements. It's like you add always one more dimension. If the akasha, ether, hearing, speech is one dimensional, then this vibration in the ether, yes, this kind of, and then this vibration meets another vibration. It creates a touch, two dimensional. It's like you are folding the same vibration onto itself and it creates a touch and then if you fold it one more time make a knot out of it not just touch but turn it onto itself it will create the knot or in the ether which will generate light heat and that will be sight and if you make one more dimension it will add one more uh, the it will become a substance without the form and that is liquidity and that liquidity substance without the form uninterrupted substance without the form any form can take will be made gross you know, on the level of prithivi and separate itself from other form if water is not separating itself yeah stays with the same bulk of substance then form can stand away from the substance so these are the five elements. It's well known. I just didn't want even to dwell on them today. But I wanted to say that Purusha's attention to Prakriti is resulting in these Indriyas because they represent the Purusha. They are the Purusha. So Prakriti is rebuilding Purusha in the, in the time and space in the form of matter. And so when he attends, he sends his faculties into her. Yeah. He is not only attending by seeing, he is attending by all his faculties. All these faculties which came out of him, they all plunged into the inconscient ocean. And from there they started their journey. They cried out to him, create for us a dwelling place in which we can stay. Because that inconscient, inconscient ocean was um, for them uh, bodiless. And they were tortured there by hunger and thirst. They didn't have the place to stay. So slowly from monocellular organism, yeah, in that monocellular organism, in that one cell tries to communicate, tries to see, tries to express itself, tries to move. There are no yet organs yeah, to move, to speak, to think, but they are all faculties are there inbuilt already in that cell. And slowly that cell starts moving, combining itself with other cells, comes into clusters, and slowly it builds all the organs necessary for functioning of Purusha. And from that monocellular organism, over the period of billions of years of evolution, we arrive at this form of human being, where there is brain, nervous system, eyes, tongue, heart, uh, feeling, all the faculties are in inbuilt and the organs are still developing becoming more and more sensible sensitive or receptive of Purusha's presence this is how he acts upon her and she is doing his work it seems that we though I wanted to just touch upon this here we can see also that Manas is operating by these two uh, Indriyas, Jnanendriyas and Karmendriyas. Sri Aurobindo has more to say on Karmendriyas. We spoke about this in another session somewhere, yes, in that these are Panis of the Veda. Uh, and these are the 
a sense um, senses of action which evolved from the inconscient and because they involved from the inconscient they do not know how to offer themselves to the divine they are not direct so to say representatives of the divine they are indirect representatives of the divine through inconscient and because of that um, they only grab the light oh, in uh, the other day we were reading in Savitri it was an amazing revelation for me somehow I never thought of it that the inconscient also tries to evolve and Sri Bindu describes this there it tries to raise itself up um, and um, and by rising up it wants more light from above and it grabs the light and puts it into the subconscious cave stores it there you know, it doesn't know what to do with it it wants it but it doesn't know what really to do with this so these are the karmendrias karmendrias are those panis the protectors of that subconscious cave they want the light they want to be more and more efficient in their actions but they do not know what that light represents they do not know the real value of that light i do not know whether it is even conceivable for you Praveen or Robin because it's the language which which is uh, which Urbindo coined yes and in this way you can see that um, whenever the actions of these five Karmendrias is activated we lose the perception of light so that's how they steal you yeah? the moment we start moving with our hands or running or uh, doing all these activities of karmendrias even speech we lose that deeper perception of light by the way the situation has changed evolutionary changed after Sri Aurobindo and the mother especially Sri Aurobindo was bringing that light into the legs when he was meditating he was walking for years in his room walking very powerfully people heard how he was making powerful steps not just walking silently but boom boom he was walking putting light into the this karmendria of pada feet that the light had to come into the body and uh, hands and speech be speech he actually quite conquered illumined now we can speak and be in the highest state of consciousness that's what happened to all those speakers like Shraddhal or, or Alok when we listen to their speech we we can can meditate and they are also falling in some kind of trance or meditative state yeah so speech has conquered certain capacity of inner light padas also we can walk we have walking meditations very popular nowadays which was not the case before at all meditation was possible only by sitting and you know closing your eyes stop breathing stop thinking that was meditation but now you have walking meditation <laughs> because the situation has changed yeah because uh, these great beings uh, like Sri Aurobindo and the mother brought the light into the into the body we did not conquer it on the level of procreatory excretory organs I mean, these are the most difficult ones they are actually blocking a lot and that's why the brahmacharya was introduced as a major power for if you want to reach the divine or realize higher levels of consciousness brahmacharya is the must uh, because it was totally destroying everything which was gained in in meditation yeah? 
Uh, but Tantra, for example, well, Vama Marga, dared to go even that way and to take this action and offer it to, to the divine. Even there they tried to do this. So there were many attempts to change the Karmendrias that they should not steal the light because Panis are the traffickers, the traders, and they are the thieves. They steal our inner light and put it into the subconscious cave. Why? Because the subconscious or inconscient also is evolving and trying to catch the light, as Shirobindo says in Savitri. It's amazing. It wants the light. That's why it is taken into the darkness. Because it wants to be enlightened, but it cannot totally be enlightened yet. So it just grabs it and puts it there. The darkness is much greater than the light which comes. So, and so the whole secret of the Veda is built on this, that the forces of light will come and destroy that cavern, that uh, uh, subconscious cave, Vala, its name is Vala, and the, all the treasures of that previous uh, conscious, evolution of consciousness will be finally released. So the, the herds of the sun, everything which was accumulated by the darkness over this long period, and this darkness was building up Karmendrias by that. Karmendrias are the result of those of that storage of light within the darkness. So you see there's much more here with these Karmendrias. They are um, a mysterious formation of evolution of building the body uh, and they have to become now more and more self-aware, so to say, and should not um, obstruct the perception of the inner light. So this is the future. Karma Yoga is one of those um, devices which could help our Karmendrias not to obstruct our inner light. Yes? Vladimir, uh, this seems to be similar to uh, what you had mentioned previously about Varuna in the later period. But uh, but in the Vedic tradition, you said Varna has a totally different uh, description. Right. But, yeah. yeah, because uh, because Varuna later, all these godheads, transcendental godheads, which are working for transformation, they lost their uh, luminosity. Sun itself became some kind of secondary deity. Uh, you know, and uh, the whole overmind disappears and supermind becomes non-existent. So the whole region of those activities of the gods uh, becomes irrelevant because the whole direction of getting knowledge changed. So there was a direction to jump into the transcendental and dissolve oneself in it instead of transforming the nature. Sankhya is a remnant of this transformation of nature, in a way. Uh, so you can see that to really make this body work, you need more and more power of Purusha. But then it got frozen in this mental structure, and so the idea would be to separate Purusha from Prakriti and leave Prakriti unembodying. Yeah? not acting at all, disappearing. So this ideal of moksha, or mukti, is of a later time, when they saw the transformation of the body is becoming so difficult, nearly impossible. Yeah. So, so Vladimir, uh, I mean, I'm not able to understand, why is Atman not mentioned here? I understand by Purusha you are referring to consciousness, correct? In this scheme? Consciousness uh, of the self, yes. The, the yeah, Purusha does not exist without Atman. Atman is the being, Purusha is his consciousness. Hmm. So that is understood that Atman is there and Purusha is the, is the being 
Yeah. Purusha is the consciousness. Yes. Purusha is the consciousness of that being, which is needed for manifestation of that being. Right. Hmm. Because while describing tapas, you were talking about uh, the being in the consciousness, the focus of the focus is the tapas. Uh, one thing is not clear is like, what is in this scheme, the ontology really? And, uh, and if this is Sankhya, then what are the Vedantic traditions talking about Vladimir? Mm. Right. For example, Advaita Vedanta, we have Dvaita, we have Vishishta Advaita. Oh, they are all uh, Sankhya, they are all Sankhya. Yeah. So is it, so is it Advaita Vedanta? Uh, I mean, what I'm not able to understand is you mentioned all the 25 are irreducibles. That means you're saying there are 25 ontological categories, but Advaita has, Advaita says there is only one ontological category. So I'm not able to understand what am I missing? Uh, oh yeah, you want to yeah you want to do a formulation in the philosophical terms yes, well uh, Advaita is um, just saying that you have to leave Prakriti and go to Purusha, dissolve yourself in Brahman. Yeah? Purusha is the way to come to Brahman. So Purusha is individual soul which will dissolve itself in the Brahman as salt dissolves in the water. Yeah? So there is no more difference between salt and water, so you have it. But Advaita or Dvaita or Vishishta Advaita, so they will all accept uh, Sankhya as a fun fundamental. So to how to separate oneself, uh, so to say, how to separate Purusha from Prakriti, this is the Prakriti. Eh? You have to leave all this. You have to deal with all these kind of stepping back from them, from the activities of Karmendrias, from activities of Indrias, you have to draw back to the Purusha. You have to separate from the activities of the mind, yeah. Yeah, so Vladimir, yeah, thanks for that. I mean, that is understood, Vladimir. Mm -hmm. But if somebody asks, are these, except for Purusha, the other 24 entities, are they real? What would be the answer? Of course they are real. They are, what is unreal here? Real is a, is a term which is coined by, you know, people of the mental structure. <laughs> oh, real, I mean, unreal, I, of course. Or I, would, or I would put it slightly different way, uh, that in the Advaita Vedantic tradition, uh, this, the other 24 elements are considered to be an illusion. Uh, they are non-existent or they are Maya. So, uh, so if you're seeing they are real, then that is this is not a Dvaita Vedanta. This would be a different thing. But uh, I'm asking that question: ontologically, are they real? Uh, or Maya, uh, what they say, Maya, it's from the point of view of Brahman. Yes, from the point of view from the beyond, they are uh, kind of uh, temporarily kind of. Uh, becoming and becoming cannot be totally real, yeah, because it is constantly in the flux of changing. So how come that it could be totally real? So it's like vidya and avidya, right? Uh, knowledge and partial knowledge is partial knowledge uh, um, uh, true uh, if it is in the flux and constantly changing on this ground it's a very mental uh, treatment of the material but uh, in the rigveda for example they speak about ritam and satyam yeah that is a dynamic truth truth of becoming what can you do with this <laughs> where would you assign it in the vedanta especially advaita there is no more distinction between satyam and ritam the truth of being and truth of becoming. Because truth of becoming becomes an illusion. Right. But it is all about beating around the bush on the level of philosophical definitions. Yeah? If you want to know the world, it has to be a kind of more experiential in a sense, looking for it. Yeah? Are these real, really? If they are here, if you can see, hear, touch, is it real or not? 
or it's only uh, is the world room. real is the question yeah the world Shubhendra says everything is real in the world and becoming and divine is real and oneness of the divine and Brahman is real everything is real so what would you ascribe that uh, thinking to which school Vladimir is it uh, that Advaita everything is real like, yeah uh, it is uh, Samhita, uh, okay. also Upanishads. Uh, Upanishads do not speak about Maya. Nobody speaks about Maya, truly speaking. Uh, and uh, and even Gita. Actually, all great synthesis of knowledge in India, Samhitas, Gita, Upanishads, even Tantra, does not totally... Uh, think in that way as Advaita. So, more or less, everything is considered real. Yeah, it's only for the sake of making Brahman more in focus from the point of view of Brahman. Every becoming is uh, um, is in the flux, and that's why. From the point of view of beingness, it is truly speaking not totally real, and that's why it is illusion. Illusion means that there is something there, but it is not going to stay. So everything which is going to stay is real, which is not is uh, not totally real. That means it's an illusion. But that's uh, only a point of view, a very mental point of view. That's why Sri Aurobindo says that Advaita and Shankara are actually treating the whole material very mentally. I never could understand this until I started to analyze myself. It is really a mental treatment. And and it's the 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 view that the world and everything is real, that is also different from Beda Beda traditions, right? Uh, no, that the world is real, Veda believes in it totally. No, no, no. The, uh, the, the Beda and Abeda. So there ah. is uh, Veda, there is Dvaita, and uh, I mean, I'm also talking about Beda, Beda traditions. There are many of them. <laughs> well, this uh, this is already a mental treatment. Yes, you can see it. It's, uh, it's for the mind, uh, to satisfy the needs of the mind, the distinctions distinction beheda and abeheda not distinguished uh, when um, upanishads started to deal with this uh, with the mind with the needs of the mind you know mind has to be satisfied our surface mind so they started to treat it in this interesting way you remember in kena upanishad avijñatam vijanatam vijñatam avijñatam Avijñatam, it is not distinguish uh, uh, vijanatam by those who distinguish and avijñatam vijanatam, oh sorry, vijñatam avijñatam and it is uh, distinguished by those who do not distinguish. <laughs> so here you have it. <laughs> So, if you want to beat the mind, it is the way to beat it. You take Ken Upanishad second uh, chapter, and it is there. You know? It's an amazing chapter. Some Yasya Matam Tasya Matam. Yasya Amatam Tasya Matam. Matam Yasya Naveda Saha. Avijñatam vijñatam vijñatam avijñatam. This is the whole answer <laughs> to beda beda. Actually, one shloka. It's difficult to comprehend right now. Huh? Difficult to comprehend right now. Okay. Yes, with, with the mind, it is difficult, nearly impossible. That's what Kenna does. Yes, it says that it is unknown by those who think it's known, and uh, by those who do not know, it is thought as known. Yeah, and uh, it is undistinguished by those who distinguish it. So the one who distinguishes it. It is distinguished as undistinguished. 
and by those who do not distinguish, it is distinguished as distinguished. <laughs> So they think, oh, now I know it, yeah? Now I understood it, yeah, now I can see. And then the moment they say this, or see this, then they fall into the category of those who do not know immediately. This is the trick. But there is more in Ken Upanishad. There's a very interesting, uh, he says, uh, um naham veda suveda iti naham veda suvedeti nona vedeti veda cha yona stad veda tad veda nona vedeti veda cha it's like again the game for the mind yeah naham i am not um uh, naham veda naham man naham man yesuveda iti i do not Consider, I do not think that I know it well, but I do not know that I do not know. Right. So I can't tell you that I know it well, but I cannot tell you that I do not know it. This is the very thin layer in between knowing and not knowing. Uh, the one who knows of us, who knows that, that means transcendental. He knows it. The one who doesn't know, doesn't know. So we have to really to know the transcendental in order to know all of this. Yeah? If, our, if transcendental for us becomes the aim for, um, you know, dissolution to, to dissolve ourselves, then it is very different from uh, from knowing this. Yeah? So knowing all this, idam sarvam, there is a whole category of uh, Upanishads created for this, all this. Yeah? So, sarvam idam sarvam, isha uh, vasyam idam sarvam, all this is for habitation by the Lord. This, all this is a manifested world, it's world of prakriti, yeah? is for his manifestation. And we can see that he is present in all the Indriyas. It is his manifestation taking place in time. It is not a finished product. It is not something we can give as a final, you know, being. But still, it is the being in becoming. It is being which is growing in consciousness. Yeah? All this is for habitation by the Lord. It is not yet inhabited fully, but it will be fully. The Lord will be revealed through all his embodiments. But it takes time. It is in time and space. And this is something which mind wants to... Um, cut off or to make shortcut through it. Yeah? Instead of speaking about this growing of consciousness, it wants to jump to something which is already, as you say, ontological reality, what is real. <laughs> this is a very um, mental treatment. Does, uh, does the Upanishads and Vedas talk about the transcendental or the Brahman wanting to transform his own identity or self? I mean, yes. you have heard. Yes. So this uh, is Lila where he's transforming himself? Yes. It's a, he wanted to be many. That's what Upanishads say in Brahmanas. Bahusyam. I want to be many. Sadvitiyam Aichat. He wanted the second. He was alone. He looked around, didn't find anybody except himself, you know. And then he was not happy. He wanted another. Bahusya, may I be many. It's everywhere. Yes? So how can you who alone uh, are become many? <laughs> and, and does he does he intend to become some somebody else? But no. you because you mentioned previously when he wants to rest from his own being, he becomes assert. 
And uh, so no, no. A sattu is his inherent freedom, so to say. It's inbuilt freedom of Brahman. It's asad Brahman. Yes, it's kind of nirguna Brahman. So it is his spirit which allows him to be himself without manifestation, without being. Um, it is something else. It's much higher or much more fundamental. It, to become many in time and space, that was the device. Time and space. Purusha. Purusha was sacrificed. The consciousness with its faculties was sacrificed for the sake of building him many. That's why most probably Sankhya treats Purusha as many and not as one. Just to you avoid all those question. things. Yeah? You answered my question, Vladimir, mm. about the Purusha rising from the inconscient waters. Oh, okay. In what way? Please share. Where you said there's something so much deeper where you know and yet you don't know. All that. <laughs> right. <laughs> On the way of knowing. That was... Yes. That was Right. The total opening of the consciousness. Yeah, these are the Upanishads. They are very profound. Yes. Yeah. I don't you think... You think with the mind. Yeah, and if you think also, then you have to have a right position of the mind. Exactly. I don't think that I know it well, but yeah. I don't know that I don't know. This is an important, it's not like I know only that that I don't know of Socrates, yeah? He knows that he doesn't know, yeah? That is his formula. Here it's more subtle. I can't say that I know it well, but I don't know that I don't know. Yeah. So, it's not Very that I know that I don't know, yeah? I don't know that I don't know. <laughs> Double. Beautiful. <laughs> That answers everything. Yeah, it's a right Please. position of the mind, which allows you to examine the, the, the manifestation and yourself and spirit and all the relations without claiming of one final formulation by the mind. Yeah? There is no final formulation by the mind. One question uh, is that when the being is liberated from these elements, then what are the faculties of the being to interact with Brahman at that level? Because I understand at that level, there is no manas, there is none of these elements. So how does the being interact at the level of liberation? This is what you are referring to the post-Vedic traditions yeah where the advaita takes over actually and uh, it is not uh, so in uh, in the vedas and upanishads there, there is vijnana maya purusha there is uh, the mind there is a super mind yeah the, here we are dealing with mind as a lower faculty as manas sense mind yeah and that's it you do not see that the sense mind has the secret in the supermind that it is a representative of the supreme truth you know, uh, which uh, which we neglected altogether we don't deal with this category altogether we don't have intuitive mind we don't have overmind we don't have supramental overmind we don't have triple supermind at all we don't deal with these we as if they don't exist and they exist, yeah? They are the reason why Manas and Buddhi are here. Right. They are their parents, or they are their projection or extension. So we do not know on kind of, the, our scheme is partial here, but though there are 25 tattvas, but this is a mental structure of consciousness. It is mentally, perfectly describing the reality in the structure which we operate now by the mind. Yeah? 
But if you consider mind to be one of the faculties, and this is what I wanted to do today, but I didn't, and maybe next time I will do, what was the pre sankhyayic tradition? So mind was one of them, one of those indriyas. He wasn't a major synthesizer of indriyas. He was one of the faculties, equal to them. There was a different view, and we will maybe look into it next time. Yeah? Sure. And we kind of enrich our understanding of the material uh, instead of kind of confusing, I hope. I, I'm already 15 minutes uh, over. Yes. Om Shanti 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 Shri Guru Bhionama Hari Om Because I can go on. <laughs> All right, see you. Thank you. Bye.